Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I am Dr. Julie Inerio. I'm one of the co-chairs for the Latinx Connect conference that we're here at, Imaginemos Juntos, Dialogues on Thriving Latinx Futures. And I'm also, um, I co-chair this beautiful event with uh, Dr. Victor Figuereo, who's also here. And we're also the interim co-directors for the Center of Ethnic Studies Research at the University of Pittsburgh under USIS. I am so excited about this talk because I feel like I'm just going to be kikiing with my friends and y'all are just here to hang out with us. <laughs> um, so I, I, I decided to name this um, talk Sankofa, Reclaiming Lat uh, Afro-Latinx Narratives in the Arts, because the theme of this conference is to imagine new futures together. And one of the things I personally am constantly thinking about is because of my own identity as an Afro-Latina is how can we continue to uplift and support and go beyond just like, hey, we exist, but like, let's have nuanced uh, representations of our community, like focusing on the hyper-specific because those hyper-specific connections, even through the hyper-specific, we're gonna find points of connect connection and highlight our interdependence as a community. So before I continue on the things that I'm very passionate about, as you can tell, um, I am going to introduce the my a fellow, I'm gonna call them my girls, my friends and panelists. Um, I'm just updating my pronouns and my name. Um, so I would like to introduce Dr. Vanessa K. Valdez. She is an author. Um, she's an author, a writer, an educator, historian, and the Associate Provost for Community Engagement at the City College of New York. She's a port she is Puerto Rican of African descent and is the author of an amazing book, by the way, Diasporic Blackness, The Life and Times of Ar Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Um, Schomburg, as I don't know if y'all know, was the founding, one of the founding fathers of Black history in North America and the father of global African um, global African diaspora. She's also written Oshun's Daughters, The Search of Womanhood in the Americas. And um, she's most recently, which I was so, so grateful to be able to experience the co-curator of the Metropolitan Museum of Arts exhibition, Juan de Pareja, Afro and Afro-Hispanic painter, which I've told, she knows how I feel about it. I was just like, right, it was amazing. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Valdez. I'm so excited that you're here. I'm going to introduce Julissa, and then we'll just get started. Uh, Julissa Contreras just had her off-Broadway debut with her play Vámonos at Intar Theater this past spring in 2023. As a writer, performer, podcaster, educator, and advocate, Julissa focuses on storytelling as a framework for the expansion of our collective consciousness and the preservation of our nuanced yet meaningful histories. Julissa leans into her perspective of the world as a Dominicana from the Bronx, as well as those as well as those of surrounding communities that have socialized her experience in the digital space. I'm sure some of you already know. You're gonna know this. As in the digital space, Julissa is the creator of the YouTube hit "Shit Spanish Girls Say." That's how I was introduced to Julissa because it was amazing. I had a great time. I was like, oh my God, so funny. Um, Y'all probably have seen, um, skid uh, yeah, Skittles on there. It's, oh my gosh, so fun. Um, she also has Ladies Who Bronche podcast and she has been featured for Me Too's The Cat Call season three, Spotify's Lenny Says, Skittles Music TV and others. Um, in addition to her artistic endeavors, Julissa has dedicated 15, over 15 years of working with nonprofits and startup organizations with a focus on community strategy, ethical engagement, DEIB practices, impact programming, media strategy, and more. Julissa enthusiastically joined the board of Intar Theater in October 2023, and she looks forward to cultivating the space to expand its impact and outreach to artists in NYC and beyond. Thank you so much for being here, Julissa. I'm such a big fan of yours. And, you know, I'm really excited to share this space with the both of you. So, um, and I'll just say a little bit about my background so people know why I'm um, kind of moderating this conversation and talking about um, 
just kind of being part of the conversation. So yes, I am co interim co-director for the Center of Ethnic Studies Research. My background is in opera. I have a doctorate in music, minor in 19th century French literature, and I started the Afro Latinx song. And oh, I also have a degree in social work. I got a master's in social work, and um, I started the Afro Latinx song and opera project. So I'm utilizing my project to commission new works that tell the stories of Afro Latin people, but also decolonize the existing classical music canon. Um, and I recently received the Advancing Black Arts in Pittsburgh grant for two years of programming here in Pittsburgh, $50,000. I'm super excited about that. So folks in Pittsburgh, you're gonna see about a bunch of Afro-Latin things happening very soon. And I hope you attend. So let's just get started. So for the both of you, and I'll eventually chime in or not, um, <laughs> um, can you share the, like we all have our respective things, right? That we've dedicated our lives to, right? artistic and diverse histories, writing. So what was the moment for you that you're like, mm, I need to lean into who I am and highlight my community um, that amplifies Afro-Latin narratives? Like, what was that moment? What was that shift? Julissa, you go first. Oh, darn, Dr. Valdez. Um, no, I well, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I can totally, I can totally go first. And it's funny, as, as you asked the question, I immediately started to think of like the pivotal touch points, right? Because the mm -hmm. truth of my journey to understanding the importance of the intention around my Afro-Latinidad actually came in waves because, you know, the idea of my artistry and, and know, knowing that, I had some sense of responsibility to my community came very early on when I was in like elementary school. I always had a big voice. I always had a big opinion and always found myself speaking on platforms, whatever that meant at that age. Um, and I was dead set on being mayor of New York City. I thought that that would be my role and that I would help, you know, evolve New York City for everyone because it, it, my love and passion for justice didn't come just from my community. It came from being a New Yorker and, you know, New York is a nationality, right? So like it's, I started there <laughs> And then, you know, as I, you know, transitioned out of this dream of politics, because the more I leaned into justice, the more I found the injustices in the space that I thought I wanted to catalyze. Mm. And, you know, I, I went into the arts, I started to write, I started to perform poetry and do a lot of other things that led me to other institutions that were white led. So like my high school I went to was LaGuardia High School Performing Arts, super prestigious, everybody loves the fame movie, but like in that space is when I started to realize the way you harness your art is called to do something more than just the joy that you receive and sharing. And it became clear to me being like one of the very few black students in my department period, let alone being Dominican specifically under the guise of, of my black identity. Also adding on the fact that I did not know how I could claim my black identity in community with other black people until college. And so in, it was in college when I signed up for a class that had the word Dominican in it because I was looking through the course book and I was like, I need extra classes. I don't know. And then there was something about something, something, something black Dominican Republic. I said, black Dominican Republic. OK, so I signed up and that's when my world has changed and literature was introduced to me. And, and the vocabulary I never had for an identity I always knew I was came into play. And then I understood the fullness of the community that I actually represent. So that for me was the moment when I was like, OK, everything I do needs to one address how underrepresented I am in the Latina space. Right. Which was the space that I considered my home when I was at home. We speak Spanish. I'm with my parents. I'm first generation. And then my second home, America, like the culture that has built me, the generations of ancestors that are shared, but specific to some African Americans that whose work has benefited me. How do I continue the work in this country, in this landscape, holding both identities and making sure that I never lose the importance of that distinction? So that was mm -hmm. my journey. Thank you. So I just want to pick up and say there's a lot of resonances. First of all, I am a New Yorkian from the Bronx. So the Here Bronx is. is very represented Here in this. <laughs> I'm not from the Bronx, um, but let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I say that to say born and raised in the Bronx. I live in Harlem now, have lived in Harlem for almost 20 years now. My family, when my mom, my mom was born in Puerto Rico, she moved to the Lower East Side and then moved to East Harlem, right? So very 
typical, my father was born in East Harlem, very typical migration story with regards to the New Eurekan community. Um, and I too had, my, my touch point was um, certainly in terms of service for community. I remember that being very early on, like my parents put me in Catholic school. So service was like every day. And I think about like Catholic brainwashing, quite frankly. And while I don't, I'm no longer a practicing Catholic, that kind of like, how are you of service to others was just foundational to me. And then I just remember, you know, for many of us, you know, I too am first gen in terms of, you know, going to college and stuff. And, you know, I thought that being a lawyer or a doctor was legible because that's the messaging, right? That's what you're, you're a success if your parents have invested in you. And so I love science, but there was a moment where I was like, man, I, you know, chemistry was blah and physics mess so on. That's not going to happen. And, uh, but I was always a bookworm and I loved reading. And I knew when I went to college, I was going to be an English major. Didn't know what the hell I was going to do with it. Thankful for my parents who said, we just want you to be happy and we trust that you're going to figure it out. So I was really thankful for that encouragement. And then my last year in college, I, you know, half my, my major was Chaucer and Shakespeare and, you know, John Donne and Glocasea. The other half was African-American, contemporary American. And then my last semester, my second to last semester, there was two classes that changed my life. And it was at the time Latino literature and the second was Afro-Hispanic literature. Mm -hmm. And both of those, they were cross-listed in English and Spanish. So what is what? And so I read the descriptions and I signed up. And the first one was the first time that I saw myself, my narratives, right? And Latino lit. I was like, wait, there is at that point, a corpus that had existed for over a century of folks whose families came from Spanish speaking, and we're here in, in the US and that conflict of language and home and diaspora and where is home and who am I and all of that in Nidiaquini Raja was that first one. Not so much about race, touched on that one. Afro-Hispanic literature was very much, right? Like readings from, that's where I read Cecilia Valdez, where Zulia and I were talking about that ahead of this call. Um, so Cecilia Valdez and, and Carlos Guillermo Wilson and, 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 and Nelson Bass and Manuel Zapata Olivella and all these Black Latin Americans unequivocally saying, no, yo soy negro, yo soy negra y ya. And there was none of the equivocation, right, of like, no, but I'm the, like, for me, that was the, the semilla of me deconstructing a nationalist identity that has never served people of African descent in this hemisphere. And so for me, when people start talking, you know, that kind of like, no, but yo no soy esto, yo soy esto. And I go, let's get this very, very clear that ninguna bandera was claiming us, except for Haiti. So let's be real clear on that, right? Like I don't, and so my diasporic framework is one in which I very much lean on much more than, yes, my work is recovery of histories. I'm most known for a recovery of a history of a man named Arturo Schomburg, who here in New York, if you know about the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, um, is one of the four research libraries of the New York Public Library. It is the premier Black archive in the world with over 11 million items, books, articles, music, statues, all the things. And a Black Puerto Rican man whose mother was from the Virgin Islands, right? Like, he's the one that started that, right? And so, and it's named after him. And it's not incidental that he was born in Puerto Rico. And he writes about how he was a child. And his teacher at the time, he was born in, 18, in 1874 as a child in the 19th century. A teacher told him Black people have no history, period. And so that's uh, as Samija. The other thing is, as he, he was a child, there were history clubs. Um, and he's in you know Primaria and Secundaria. And he saw like that his counter folks within a Puerto Rican space could much more easily claim heroes than he could as a young black boy in Puerto Rico. So when we deconstruct these narratives of like, no, la gran familia Puerto Ricana, no, toditos somos iguales, and all of this, when, when we get past that, we start understanding, like, let's acknowledge that Latinidad is foundationally anti-black because all of us have heard certain things about who you dating, who you bring into the home, don't hang out with them. Like, let's stop, let's talk about hair, let's talk about all the things, stop it. Like, let's, and so that was, that was for me, those were the seed points when I was in college that just, my professor, thank you God, when I went to him, I said, I wanna study this more. And he said, you should go get a doctorate. And I was like, who's getting a doctorate? That's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, because I was 20 years old, but guess who got a doctorate? Um, and also, along that space, 
was encouraged to, hey, you're studying Latin America, you gotta study Brazil. And so learn, getting my master's in Portuguese in addition to my master's in Spanish, and like really, like really coming to, like, so I'm trained hemispherically and I'm trained to see like, wait, but there are these things that are in common, right? And these histories that are in common. Um, and so that, so all of those, I appreciate you Lisa saying there were touch points because it's not just one moment, right? It's these seminal moment, I hate that word, critical moments <laughs> um, throughout life that you kind of go, oh, wow, this angel led me this space or this moment led me this where, And all of that is kind of built up to where I am now. Wow. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I, um, I relate so much to the both of you. I'm also first generation. And oddly enough, I was born in New Jersey. I was born in Hoboken, New Jersey. So um, a Northeast girly too. Mm -hmm. And um, but my mom, I was the youngest of eight, said, hey, I want you to know your culture. Move me to Dominican Republic when I was one. Mm. Turned to the U.S. till I was eight. So my mm -hmm. first language is Spanish. I have, I'm first generation with like, a, like I immigrated experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is really interesting and but I grew up in Miami which it's, it's to folks that have not experienced Miami it is not the south and it's not the U.S. it is like north of Havana sm its own Latin American absolutely conglomerate absolutely. like country so I didn't I very passively experienced the anti-blackness but I never had to examine my identity because everybody knew I was Dominican. Yep. And it wasn't yep. until I left that bubble mm -hmm. that all of a sudden I go to Louisiana for grad school, right? LSU mm -hmm. years. I they went. <laughs> I um all of a sudden I'm getting questions like, are you black and white or black and French? People thought I was Creole. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Does even mean I don't understand what's going on here? Mm -hmm. But that's not to say that I didn't know that I wasn't black, right? Because like you said, I had don't go out in the sun for too long. Mm -hmm. They used to straighten the rizando mi pelo. I'm sorry, in English. Uh they were like straightening my hair since I was five years old, right? Mm -hmm. Things like that. And for my project, the Afro Latinx Song and Opera project, I remember getting a whole doctor, I was getting a doctorate in music. I did a specialty recital, all music in Spanish and the Spanish language. And so it was like Spain and Latin America. I could not find a single thing that had to do with Afro Latinos. And I was like, this is so weird. Mm -hmm. And I found one piece that was part of the canon, which was Afro-Cuban poetry set to music by a Catalan composer. Mm. And I'm telling, and I just looked at this and I was like, people don't, this is kind of violent. Like it's a little, it's a little violent. I, I where are the Afro Latin composers? So that stayed with me. And it wasn't until quarantine where, you know, music shut down. I had time to think and I thought back to that moment. And I was like, there has to be more Afro Latin composers in classical music. And I did like a very easy search and I found one. And I was then I got upset. I got pissed because I said, why was this not taught to me? Why was mm -hmm. no that so, moment how much I paid for that doctorate and, <laughs> mm -hmm. and nobody told me anything so I was angry but then I saw oh let me just do something about it because what do we do as first generation black women yep. when we find that there's a gap yep we're like oh well I'll do it yep so yeah. I applied for my first grant and I got it which is crazy and I started my project mm -hmm. but I want to touch on a couple of things that y'all mentioned which is um, I, I want to go, I'm going to go a little bit backwards. Thank you so much for saying that. Yes, I'm doing Latin American work and I'm all, like, that includes Brazil. This mm -hmm. is that continues to, to, um, always baffle me. I conceptualize uh, Latinidad as a geographical space. So I include Haiti. I include Brazil. I include mm -hmm. Guyana. I mm -hmm. include all of these places in for me, but it, it's not the, for whatever reason, that's not everybody that does that. So thank you so much for saying that. And um, for all of the folks listening, Brazil, Haiti, Guyana, that's, they're Latinos too, right? In mm -hmm. this geographical space that have been touched by coloniality in the same ways that we have, just mm -hmm. because Spanish, just because they're not speaking Spanish doesn't mean that it's not there's not relational points there. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much for sharing that. So what challenges um, do you have y'all faced and have you seen other Afro-Latin artists face as they try to 
uh, uplift their narratives in the spaces that we're in that tend to be, that probably have a very homogenous conception of Latinidad. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> do you, do you want to go first, Dr. Vega? No, dale. You were right. <laughs> <laughs> the, the big, uh, the, I sorry. Now what? I'm putting in name. Um, okay. I, I actually, like, I, I believe that there are levels of challenges, right? There's the easy thing to name, which is like, look, we have predominantly white spaces we're navigating. And in that, you know, like there are blockers that are inherently in place. Some of them are racist. Some of them are sexist. Some of them are just classist, right? And like even white people get to experience them, right? So there are those typical things. But what I want to put more intention and time to speak towards are the challenges I have faced being Afro-Latina and trying to introduce more language and work that is speaking towards Pan-Africanism and mm -hmm. wanting to actually think of ways to be representative, to be intentional and create things that audiences can consume to undo this separation that we have amongst the diaspora, mostly mm -hmm. because within Latinidad and, and, and Dr. Valdez said it before, it's almost like Latinidad can be anti-racist, right? Like it is, I mean, anti-Black. Um, yeah. And so like sometimes it's not, um, it, it's not that we don't want to be proud Latinas as Black women. It's just that even within Latinidad, because there is such a mix of races and indigenous people in that grouping, we then get placed back into the same social class norms and racist institutional norms that we face even just in the American space. And so for me, the, the hardest part is not being able to unify my people. For me, the hardest part is being able to say, hey, I'm producing a play. Yes, there is Spanish in this play just as much as there is there is English, but that does not mean that we cannot promote this play on, on Black-led spaces, right? For example, right. I had an interview, I went to El Palo con Coco, um, Lo Coco Clasico for anybody who's New York or La Mega, whatever. And I was able to do that. And that was super exciting to me. And so <clears throat> when I had turned to the sort of production, to the people who were doing the marketing for the show, which was not the theater, it was like an extension of the theater. And I was like, all right, so like, can you get me like on Hot 97 or something like that? Right. Like, how, how big are we talking? Because to me, La Mega is like the Hot 97. Right. And I and there was questioning around, well, how do we know that that audience will connect and isn't the Spanish going to be an issue? And like once we start to let the language that unifies us as Latinos, Latine people start to bleed into how we are able to engage each other in spaces where the hyphen to the kind of Latinidad we carry comes into play, whether that's being indigenous or being black or maybe being white, Spain, purebred, and you proud of that, whatever that is for you, like mm -hmm. my attention and intention is in my community. So I really struggle with this reality that the division has cut so deep that I don't know how much unity I will get to see in my generation, but I know it's something that I have to continue to fight for and speak for. And no matter how much people try to tell me, oh, well, you're not, you're not black or you're not African American. So like, you don't understand, like I need to continue to extend the grace of the, that being a product of a colonization that I too had to unlearn. We're just yep. in different stages of our unlearning. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, I know. I think I've had I've had the reverse um, reactions where, you know, again, here's where colorism takes place. Right. And I will say this where people have paid attention to my nose, paid attention to my hair. Right. And have been like and I, I've, I've told folks there's no y'all know that I'm not white. Let's just stop. Right. Because Latinos like, you know, los Latinos son los primero, right. That they will be like, mm. right. And they're not going to say nothing. But this so. My, for me, my most racist interactions have been in Latinx spaces, right? Where like people have let me know either vocally out, like out loud or just body language that I don't belong there. Within black spaces, absolutely, like completely embraced. Now, here's what's really interesting though, is then when I have like darker skins, Afro in particular, not even in particular, but like darker skin Afro Latinos come to me and they go and there's suspicion there. And I have to, you know, for me, I don't focus on, oh, I have to prove myself to anybody. It's coming to understand that you need to hear where my alliance lies and I need to articulate that. And that's fine. I have no issue with that. I remember an older woman, I was doing a uh, um, presentation on Arturo Schomburg for the African-American Geneological Society. 
they had mm. invited me to talk about this. And afterwards, a woman comes up to me and she goes, you a Trojan horse, aren't you? And I said, well, what do you mean? And she goes, well, we all thought you were going to say something based on how you looked. And you be- you come out, you all pro-black. <laughs> and there was an older woman, an older African-American woman. And I was like, yeah, basically. Because if I'm in Latinx spaces, I'm going to call out anti-blackness, right? I'm going to call attention to how many people that if I'm the darkest person in the room, there's an issue, right? And so particularly within educational spaces, who are you earmarking as brilliant? Who are you telling, hey, who are you encouraging to go for that fellowship or that internship? Who are you advancing? And that takes a lot of self-reflection, which we should be doing as educators anyway. And then within Black spaces, I do talk about oftentimes I acknowledge the pain that so many people have experienced where they've had Latine people telling them, I'm not Black. I said, well, let's acknowledge this. Let's call this out because you're coming from a space of pain. And I'm sorry that somebody that looked like me hurt you. But I'm telling you that there are also people who look like me who are reclaiming our histories and we're doing work on both fronts. Yes. Thank you for saying that because I have also had experiences. And I think Julissa and I touched on this when we talked once where we were like, some people told me I'm not Black because I'm Latina. And some uh, folks have told me I'm not Latina because I'm too Black. (laughs) <laughs> like, yeah. and so and that's where you know uh, our keynote for this was uh, Dr. Nancy Lopez and that's where we get into the street race right I literally had to tell you know uh, an African-American colleague of mine that was questioning my blackness I said do you think that somebody me walking down the street somebody's gonna know the difference between me and you right Culturally? right right Why I... my experiences as a black woman because you think that as a Latina I don't experience uh, uh you know Afro-Latina Black, Latina, Latina, whatever, I don't experience the same kind of harm that right. you do because right. of how we're codified based on how we're pers- how we're seen. And so- let's trust, I mean, you lived in Louisiana. I lived in Nashville for seven years, right? Trust that in Nashville, Tennessee, I'm there was no, oh, you're Latina, what kind of Latina? You are a light-skinned Black woman. And I go, yeah, I am. Period. Yeah. I'm clear on this. <laughs> Racially, there is no conversation. You know, and so that's why, like, I come back to New York and then people are like, but well, how was that for you? They thought you were black. I said, I am black. <laughs> what are we talking about? Right. Que, que yo hablo español y también yo falo portugués. Es otra cosa. Mas yeah. las personas cuando me están viendo, what are they looking okay. at? They're looking at a black woman. Like, let's be real about this. Like, come right. on, y'all. That's the through line. Black. Yeah. And, and, and I'm... Hey, and I would say, I love that y'all are saying this because right now I'm in Denver, right? Like I live between New York and Denver. Um, and I have, my higher vibrational self has stepped in on my pattern of doing this thing where I love to go into spaces where I see there's predominantly Latina people and see them sort of overlooking me or dismissing me as Latina. And I start speaking Spanish and like, I kind of live for the shock value a little bit as a New Yorker is fucked up. I need to change that. I need to, we're growing out of that, right? But like there's, there was something that was like tickling me about it at first because it was so mind blowing to me that even though prior to moving to Denver, I had been to Denver several times and was able to digest and understand the differences in the culture, whether that was indigenous, whether that was, you know, indigenous Mexican or like native American, like there's a lot going on here on this land. and you know, for a land that has such a strong history with peoples like indigenous people, it was so striking to me how there was no connection amongst the Latina community around the fullness of their identity. And so sometimes like being Latina also means that like you are also competing with people that are so far in a particular lane of how they identify there that like you can't be a part of the conversation. They don't see you as like the same kind of ally as somebody who looks like them you have to do all this work to be accepted. And honestly, sometimes you have to get disrespected because the amount of times I've spoken Spanish, second, right? Not doing my shock value thing. I'm behaving. I'm coming into the space, speaking my English, letting them think what they think. And they're struggling through their English. And I feel bad because I'm like, yo, I could easily just start speaking Spanish. I'm going to respect that. I start speaking the Spanish and many times what happens to me is I get looked at as if I'm disrespecting them as if I maybe think they're dumb and I'm a black girl who learns Spanish and now I'm trying to like come down to their level. And it's it's an interesting experience how the thing that we like to lead with as our unifier is also the thing that would be the first thing someone would use against me to divide us. Mm-hmm. Don't speak Spanish to me. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I, 
I I've had moments where I talk to somebody in Spanish and they respond to me in English because what they see and what they're hearing it doesn't match you <laughs> in their head for like what like they believe and that's when I realize how much people internalize these homogenized identities that are fed to us through white supremacy culture so it's like we have to fight against that mm -hmm. to then have the conversations that we want to have yes mm -hmm. Taisha said I'm rooting for everybody everybody black same exactly mm -hmm. I'm rooting yeah. for everybody black this yeah. is a global, global diaspora, right? And, you know, when I write my grants for my project and they ask me, who's my audience? And I say, other Black people, because they yep. got to know the diaspora is vast. Yeah. And if other folks outside of the Black community want to learn, amen to that. But, <laughs> but who, I'm, who I'm focused on is my Black, beautiful, global community. So they know how vast and beautiful this diaspora is. Because Absolutely. our people don't even know how the brilliance and the touch points of blackness throughout the world. Yep. In the Absolutely. different ways it's expressed. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to encourage you both because I think I'm older than you both. I'm going to encourage you both, right? Because it, it really is like, this is kind of a self-care moment, which you might like touch on. But, you know, it's always really important to me that when we are speaking about pain, that we also encourage like, okay, where's the healing, right? And so for me, we can absolutely get caught up in the ni de aquí, ni de allá, and the falta de repeto and all of that, right? When we go home and we're just like, damn, I got to do this again tomorrow and the right. next day and the next day. And I just really want to encourage, right, just there are millions who identify as ni de aquí, ni de allá, literally, right? And sometimes we, we discount that. Right. There's three there. There are actually five of us in this room. Two are behind the scenes. Right. But there are three of us like in this room talking with each other. Right. And that's power. Right. Yeah. And so really focusing on when I started, I was the I served as the director of the Black Studies program at City College of New York for three years. And when I started that position, I asked someone for their advice. They said, lean into the yes, always let the no's go. Doesn't mean they don't hurt but let them go, yeah. but lean into the yeses because when you lean into the yes, then you're like, oh, okay, all right, this is possible. Okay, I know her and I know him and I, okay, ¿Qué es lo que vamos a hacer? Because ahí sí es que, you know, we're, we're, we're constructing. But if we stay in the space of like, and I just try to focus on, it's easier, I think for me when I was teaching in particular, you know this, we all know this, the, the yearning is so deep for our histories right? Yeah. It's like, it's a real yearning and we can get caught up in the folks reacting because they don't know. But then like to develop relationships with folks, right? I'm sure, you know, reactions to your YouTube series, reaction to theatrical projects, right? Where people are like, oh, di I just didn't know, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, that's what we hold on to, right? Is when the spark, when people spark and they're like, I didn't know this was going to hit me. I didn't know this was going to resonate with me. And it's like, yeah, this for you too. Now, seguimos. Yeah. You know? So so I just wanted to like say that out loud. Thank you for bringing that up. That could really, I, I didn't have this question planned, but do you, I, I want to just kind of go off of the healing aspect. In the work of centering Afro-Latin narratives, do you find healing for yourself? Yeah. And the experiences that you've had being able to kind of move in that in your work. Yeah, I mean, let me let me be. Do you, I'm sorry, Julissa, I didn't go, Julissa. No. <laughs> I was gonna. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna say this. I want to be very, very clear on this. The most, the things that got me through grad school, because grad school is a thing, y'all. Like, ooh, that's a journey. The thing that got me through grad school when I was in Nashville, Tennessee, and again, Nashville wasn't the issue. But me being 20 years old in a PhD program was the issue, quite frankly, um, because I was too young and I didn't understand the, I didn't understand what is known as the hidden syllabus and all the codes and all the whatever. Um, I just didn't know. So I came in not worshiping the sacred cows that I was supposed to be worshiping and not bowing down to the pedestals that I was supposed to be. I was just kind of like, nope, Gabriel Garcia Marquez is racist. What? Like, <laughs> you know, and they were like, yeah, yeah I know the soledad es lo, lo, lo mejor. And I was like, that mess is racist, right? Like him and all the boom folks, like what are we talking about? So anyways, um, and obviously I've not let that go. So black feminists are, are what yes. fed my soul, 
I mean, and so I'm here, I'm going to shout out, like, I continue that Toni Morrison talking about, we focus on Black communities, that's it. You don't focus on the white gaze. You focus, and racism is a distraction. And they're going to have you, they're going to keep you right here, and you have to prove yourself and prove your worth and prove your humanity. Do your work. Do your work, and that's what resonates. And that's what keeps me centered, right, is Black feminist work and Tazaki Shange and her being so inclusive and you know i've written about Nsizaki Jange and her you know for her being in new york city where she was dancing salsa right like the 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 color girls who considered suicide were also spanish speakers right if you look at like who was there like there was one woman who was like yep she's dancing salsa she's doing her thing and people are like hey wait a minute and if you go through her oof she put she includes haiti she includes mozambique she includes angola she includes so and Sasaki Shange was one who was diasporic, right? And vast and deep, right? Tony K. Bambara, you know, like there's certain authors that like I go back to their interviews. And they get, like, when I first read the Kambahi River Co Collective, and like I just started crying because I had seen myself. They talked about how much intellect in Black girls is disproved, is disregarded, is dismissed. And I just started weeping because I, th I thought about experience that I had had as a child in predominantly white spaces yeah. that I didn't label as racist because I didn't have the language, right? Yeah. And like, you know, I think um, one of you, uh, Zuli, you just said that you didn't know what it was to be quote unquote Dominican as per like an outside view until you went to grad school, right? I didn't know what Puerto Rican was because I'm in New York, like whatever, until I went to college. And that yeah. was when people were like, do you wear a bulletproof vest? to school and I was like I would I'm, I'm sorry what like I was just like what and that was the first time that I had to confront narratives that God bless my parents who had protected me from stuff who had never let any limitation be a part of our discourse within that household so it's it's in it's in the encounter that you go oh shit wait a minute like how who do you think I and that's where the double consciousness kicks in Yes. But again, then you, I have black feminists going, stay right here, center mm -hmm. it. Quédate ahí, mi mito. Porque if you go out, it's really easy to get caught up in that distraction. Truly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm only, shout out to black feminisms also saved my life, continues to save me and nurture me and water me and help me grow. So shout out to that. Um, also, I, you've said this twice that you've thanked your parents for just you know, encouraging you to do anything that you wanted to do. I also want to shout out my beautiful, uh, you know, immigrant parents that I told them that their 15 year old daughter said, I want to be an opera singer. They had no idea what it was. And they said, if you want to do that, honey, go ahead, go dedicate your life to singing opera. And they just encouraged me the whole way. And um, yeah, because that takes it's not everybody that gets that luxury of being first generation to just follow their dreams, their literal dreams. Yeah. So you have continued. Yeah, no, I, I I think riffing straight off of that, like as 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 you were talking, I, I I was thinking about my parents. So I think it's even interesting that that's how the transition ended up because I for me, my parents did a really good job of and and they didn't call it this because being growing up in a seven day Adventist household, though I do not, I do not practice seven day Adventism anymore. Mm -hmm. um, the self, right. Pointing me back to my intuition. They didn't know they were, it was intuition for them. It was like, that's God talking. So intuition mm -hmm. is God talking. And so for me, I was always so strongly redirected to myself that even in the moments I was having, like you mentioned the moment of like being, at, being asked, Oh, do you go to to do you wear a bulletproof vest and stuff like that for me it was in high school like you know coming in and, and I'm in New York City so I'm not even being placed out of where mm -hmm. where I'm from being asked by the other white kids who had gone who were from Brooklyn number one I don't be for Brooklyn but they were from Brooklyn and they were white and they had been coming from these prestigious middle schools and they were like oh so so are like gunshots your lullaby I will never forget somebody wow. who has been asked me. So like, and I'm from Soundview. I'm from 174th in the Bronx, right? right? So like for me, I'm like, 
man. And it was that moment where I was like, I've no one would ever say that to me in any of my previous schools. And then I was like, wow, who I am and all the things that are about me. I'm now in a space where no one knows me, no one understands. And so the, my healing and needing to like create a strong sense of self started before I even knew I was black and was, and I am grateful for, because everything happens for a reason. I was able then to digest and understand all the literature and all the things that grounded me and continued to be healed for me. And, and I love our women as well. So I echo what you said, but for me, it was James Baldwin. For mm. me, it was James Baldwin who mm -hmm. actually opened up my world and the way in which James speaks of his community, our accountability to self. The The letter he wrote to his nephew is, is still one of my favorite pieces of things I've ever read in my life because it almost felt like somebody was putting words to what I believed about my own community, my own future for myself and my community, the justices and injustices. Like, you know, like I... It was important. And I think that it underscored for me the importance of continuing to study those who have come before us, not because, oh, they're your style, or if you are an artist or somebody who orates, you're copying them. They don't need to relate to your style at all. It's right. the nuggets of truth that creators like us put into the work that we create for in the first place, right? Like okay. it's not just so you like us and our style is so that you collect what is yours. And so those things heal you. And so I say that to encourage people to read more because it took me a long time to put more respect on what it means to continue to study black voices and black voices outside of whatever part of the diaspora that you represent. And then the last mm -hmm. thing I'll add to that, right, is that where I've now landed in my journey in being able to listen to my intuition is I've always been a seer, right? We call it seers. If you watch Vamanos, if, if that work ever comes across you, that story is based in the reality that I was living as a young child, having visions and things happening and not having a way to really navigate what that means. And I'm now like, I practice Ifa, I'm initiating Ifa, I'm a daughter of Chang'o, right? Mm -hmm. and, and being a daughter of Chang'o, right? And Chang'o is, for, a lot of people know who he is, even if they're not, you know, tethered mm -hmm. in belief systems at all. And so Everything I am, everything I've ever put into my work, how I show up everywhere has always been very Chango energy, like before I knew his name. And yeah. so when that moment came where suddenly, right, like this practice that I'm leaning into is aligning with the truth that has come from me in my course since childhood through my parents. I am able to find my healing through leaning into the truths of what it means to walk in such a path. Even mm -hmm. if, and I always say, if tomorrow the world ends and we find out that what Ifa says is wrong, I am still right in where I need to be in order to navigate myself and, and get my um, gems where I need to. So I think we mm -hmm. all kind of deviate from things or maybe put an impression on something and say, oh, well, that's not for me because, you know, either I'm Christian, if you're talking about African tradition practices, yeah. not even a religion, because there are practices when people mm -hmm. pour the dead homies, that's come a on, Come on, come on, come on now. Vibration, you know Let's what I mean? And so like, there's so many things we already do. And so I think healing is connecting back to your culture through the vehicles that have been placed in your face for you to engage, whether that's literature, religion, et cetera. Yep. And I just want to like pick up that, 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 talking about spiritual practices as the author of a book called Oshun's Daughters, right? The Search for Womanhood in the Americas and talking about, hey, like that is a, a book of literary analysis that people go, oh, you're going to write about Oshun. And it's like, I'm writing about how women throughout this hemisphere seek out Oshun, naming her Oshun, not La Santa Caridad de Cobre, not any other Oshun, period, in Brazil, in Cuba, in the DR and the United States, right? And they're seeking her out specifically because there's no room within a Christian ideology for a complexity of portraitures of womanhood, right? And so when people come across, you know, I, I remember when I was writing that book and I was teaching these novels and like the resistance within my predominantly Latine population of students here in Washington Heights and, and, and West Harlem, um, you know, and they were like, Eso es brujería, whatever. and then I would just like slowly, here we go. And they would go, oh, pero mi tía hace esto, mi primo, lo que sea, whatever. And I said, when did we reject knowledge systems that sustains our people for millennia? Because, you know, if you're talking about your tía que en el campo hace algo, hace un festival cada año, but you and your modernity and your progress reject that, why? Because you have more formal education than your tíos did? 
why you know what is our connection to the lands like we come we are again that that's why i emphasize like african diasporic we come from a certain place all of us right and these and whether it's you know uno tiene vista uno tiene lo que es, wait a minute now and it's a very interesting thing because while people out de la boca para afuera know me more about the from the arthur the schomburg book mm -hmm. don't sleep on oshun's daughters because Oshun's Daughters is probably like my most well-read book that people come up to me and they're like, this is a classic, you know, did you know? And I'm just like, thank you. So it doesn't get the same amount of shine because it's more, it, I think people hold it closer, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's particularly women, because it's talking about spirituality. It's talking about how we define ourselves as women, right? Relationships with mothers, relationships with sisters, relationships with ourselves, with our sexualities, Um and so, yeah, I just, I want to like plug in with regards to sometimes there are things that resonate with us and we have to struggle with, oh shit, but I didn't, I didn't learn this, right? I don't know, you know, like, and so there's that like, ah, identity and this is who I am, but it's still resonating. We don't know why. Y la llamada está ahí. And we don't know why. And it could be spirit. It could be, you know, profession. It could be any number of things. Yeah. It's like, being comfortable with the discomfort of unlearning the like the colonialities that we've internalized mm -hmm. so in touch with our ancestral knowing that they want to block out so that we don't know who we really are. Absolutely. On that note, I want to open it up to questions so that we have, I know people are going to be asking things. <laughs> so for the folks on the call, if you want to ask a question, you can drop it on the chat or you can go ahead and like raise your hand and unmute yourself and ask us questions. Um, so please feel free. If you want, no pressure. Because <laughs> obviously we can keep talking. <laughs> we can do this for four hours, y'all. <laughs> we can be like, so, ah. <laughs> Next thing you know, there's musiquita and the conspiracy. But I want, I mean, if I, I, I want to circle back to something you said, Uli, at the beginning, because um, I remember watching every year we watch the, the Kennedy Center Honors. Yeah. And I remember two in particular, when yeah. Martina Arroyo was honored I mean. and when yeah. Tanya Leon was honored, like the, the just how offended I was. Like, let me get this straight. There are Black Cuban women and Black Puerto Rican women who are out, who've been doing this for decades. And again, talking about why don't we know this, right? Yeah. Like, and so like every generation is going, oh no, well, theirs is the one. Theirs right. is the one. And it's like, well, damn, ma, like we actually have like, again, we have a whole corpus of people. Yeah, I always hope like when I talk, when I'm in like, um, in opera, like non-opera spaces, non-classical music spaces. First of all, just me being there saying, hey, I'm an opera singer. People are like, what? They think I'm a unicorn, right? Yeah, of course. For those who don't know, Martina Arroyo is a very, very famous, like legend, like open doors for other black women, opera singer, regularly singing at the Met. One of like the singers from the golden era of, you know, African-American and Puerto Rican descent from New York. And she's still with us. <laughs> she's still alive. And Tania Leon, which I will be singing some of her music April 28th in Pittsburgh for my Afro-Latin recital. Um, she's a living Afro-Cuban composer. Um, I'm going to be singing one of her um, pieces from a, she actually set to music a radio play, mm. a Nigerian um, uh, writer. And um, it's called The Scourge of Hyacinth. And I'm singing uh, a song about, I'm singing to Jim Aja. Yep. So, um, so this is all interconnected. And so, yeah, so Tania Leon, and she's a Pulitzer Prize winner. She won a Pulitzer Prize for one of her compositions. So if y'all want more information about that, please reach out. Anybody have any questions? If not, we'll keep on kicking. So any questions from anybody? As we're waiting for anybody's questions, I want to touch on um, just um, talking, you, you talked about Vamonos, Julissa, and where that came from. Um, Vanessa, I want to ask you about the process of being co-curator of the Juan de Pareja exhibit. And um, just for the folks on the call, the Juan de Pareja exhibit was an exhibit about an Afro-Hispanic painter. And um, I, um, I got to experience it being somebody that does the classical arts 
to see myself feel seen in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I was like, oh, and of course, I know Dr. Curtis, Ariana Curtis was also involved. And that's yeah. like, it's, and I love her. So I was yeah. like, there to support y'all. I was like, yes. So um, yeah, tell us a little bit more about how that all got um. Yeah. So David Pullins is the curator at the Met and he was doing research on Juan de Pareja, um, which if people just Google that name, you will see a portrait from 17th century by Diego Velasquez um, that is really famous, but people don't know his name. Um, and so he was looking up this portrait. He was looking up the bibliography of the research on this man. And in the Met, everything that was written was by white folks. And that's it. And it was like 17th century, 18th century, 19th century block, 20th century, right? Nothing. Except for this one article written by this dude named Ar Arthur Schomburg that was published in The Crisis. So he goes, who the hell is Arthur Schomburg? Googles him, finds me, hello, how are you? And orders my book, reads my book and says, wait a second. So here you have a man who, again, of African descent, of African heritage, reclaiming these narratives. And Arturo Schomburg at the beginning of the 20th century, the other part of this is there were two distinct audiences. We're talking about Harlem Renaissance, right? You Negro moment. Arturo Schomburg is talking about Juan de Pareja and Diego Velasquez and, and communities of peoples of African descent in Spain in the 17th century at that moment. And so the work that is being done on Arturo Schomburg is amazing and blossoming because someone's going, wait a second, but then he's the father of Afro-Iberian studies. And I go, yep. And then, so it's all happening. Anyways, David reached out to me. I received to have a two hour Zoom call with him providing context. And then three weeks later, he's like, you want to co-curate this with me? And I was like, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> and so I am blessed to have invitations like that where people look at me and they go, do you want to do this? And my deepest honor in giving, you know, luz para el espíritu de, del señor Arturo Schomburg is he knows that all that I want to do, my intention really is in bringing his life to more people. Mm -hmm. And so my guiding principle when I was working with him, at, with David at the Met was, oh my God, people are going to learn about Arturo Schomburg and the Schomburg mm -hmm. Center at the Met. So, you know what I mean? Like, that's what, but I'm very clear about that. Like, it's not about like, oh, everybody's going to know my name. Like, I know my name. I'm cool. My peoples know my name. It's not about me. But it yeah. is about like, if I'm honoring this man, then my focus is on him. Yeah. Right. And so, and and quite frankly, the work that I've done with Arturo Schomburg, the invitations that have come based on the work that I've done for him, means I, it is always my honor to talk about him and to talk about the Schomburg Center and the work that they do. And continuing his legacy, right? Continuing his legacy of highlighting Afro African diasporic art. We do have yeah. a his in our histories, right? We do have a history. And yeah. so continuing on that specific thread um of just kind of as the practitioners of what we're doing, decentering ourselves and keeping in mind the community, right? So I, when I think about my project and people like, I'm like, it's not a vanity project. I'm just trying to set down a foundation that other people are going to run with, right? Because yep. it's not about me. It's about the yep. community. How do you see yourselves as you're practicing that? Do you see yourself as like, I'm just setting down some things so that other people see that's a possibility? Hmm. Hmm. I think for me, it does start with the rage that comes from not having had it first. So there is that mm. little selfishness you know mm -hmm. I will remove myself from the equation but I think that part of and, and I'll speak as a as a writer more so right there mm -hmm. there's this phrase we say where it's like kill your darlings right there are certain things mm -hmm. like your work that is super precious and is hard to let go of, but you have to let it go for the greater good of the work. I believe that it is in that stage where um, the people who will be impacted by my work, the people who will touch and, and really see it and be in it, where that experience and how this will leave them, right? Right. Like when they walk away, that really comes into play. And I start to care, not because I care if they think a line I have to cut is funny or not, like you have to be able to let that part of your ego go as an artist and say, what is the intention? If this is my, and I always say, if this is my like piece of history that, you know, thousands of years from now, somebody's going to pick it up. 
right? And this is what I'm going to be associated with. What does that mean for, what do they get even, right? The people who are get, who are picking it up at that time. So I think of myself that way, but I also am humble enough to recognize that it doesn't always start from the greater community, but I'm a part of my own community, right? Yeah. So like it's that, but also, you know, and you had asked me about Vamanos. So I, Vamanos for me, first of all, I got produced in a year where for the first time in all of history in New York City theater, three Afro-Latinas were produced at the same time. This has not happened. And it just so happened that one of the shows that was was right across the street from me, and it was called Bees and Honeys by Guadalice del Carmen, Dominicana from Chicago. Mm-hmm. And she was right across, across the street from me um, at MCC Theater, which is a theater that I have a, a a completely different history with from youth uh, being in their youth company. And it was one of the first predominantly white theaters that like took me in and like I was able to benefit from the tools of all the wonderful things they had right for their audiences. And it was interesting to be sitting in that moment across the street at Intar Theater, which is one of the oldest Latina theater companies in the country. Right. But is this tiny little thing. And like even going up the elevator to walk into the theater, people were like, this is a setup. I'm about to get robbed. Like, like the just the condition of the space was so vastly different than this shiny new beautiful theater that's across the street that is led by white people versus what is led across the street by latina people and and i understood in that moment that i could either lean into what colonialism and capitalism have very well trained me in which is to compete right yeah. compete or i was going to take a moment and say you know what I don't got to fight with them across the street just because that theater looks nicer. I don't have to like act like my story is not good enough because their set is more beautiful. Like, you know, like those sorts of things. I had to let that go. And what what happened instead is that Guadalice and then Kristen Eve Cato, who was the other Afro-Latina, like the three of us were just like, well, in real life, we're all friends. In real life, we understand each other's missions. So this is part of our real life. We all handle it the way we handle all of our life. We cross-promoted with each other. We did community events. Beautiful. Um, you know what I mean? There was just so much that we did that these theater companies were were like gagging because they don't get along necessarily all the time, you know? Right. And so like they, the fact that the force of the artist that was in the space had to force these institutions to not institution how they institution was right. super powerful for them. But for me, felt down, felt like we were laying something down for whenever there's more artists like us, and they may not be Afro Latina, they might be Afro Caribbean, they might be, you know, from Africa. Like it, it doesn't matter. There's a way in which people did not know how to promote our shows. People did not know how to put respect on the nuances of the stories we were telling, and so we let it. And it, we were not afraid to to be like, and you know, I have some marketing experiences, but the collective, they're not like marketers. We're not like well-versed in these things as people who go to college or have decades working in it, but we know ourselves and we know our people and we know how to talk to our people. And that's all marketing marketing is, is the story that they're going to sell you so that you can buy something from them. And what we wanted to sell was the nourishment of a story that was not on Broadway in all respect to Lin-Manuel, but was not in the Heights. Like, yep. you know what I mean? Like, I <laughs> you know, like was not these representations that like we are very glad to see as artists, the ways in which our communities have advanced. But if we are really keeping it funky with ourselves, th- our advancements in in Hollywood, in theater, in the music industry have not been indicative of the true power that we hold in the creation. Absolutely. Thanks. Amen. Thanks. They're Absolutely. not. And so it's up to us to to gas ourselves up. Like a lot of people are like, girl, how are people going to feel when they walk into that theater? They're going to feel like I walked them into exactly what they needed to experience. And there was not a single person that walked out of that theater. And not to be cocky, but just to show you the power of self-belief, like having people like Lynn only didn't make it to the show because the day he was coming to the show and had the ticket reserved down was the day that the cloud of smoke was all over New York mm-hmm. City. Everybody could mm-hmm. read it. Fun fact, Lin-Manuel has bad asthma, right? But like, not only did I get people like Lin, I had people like Amanda Seyfried, who's the girl from Mean Mm -hmm. Girls, who checks her boobs for the Mm -hmm. weather, like uh, Tommy from Power, like just like all these, I don't name. I'm not even gonna name drop everybody, but like there are these people who are like, I'm like, you live on my Instagram feed. What are you doing inside of this theater to see my work right now? And people who are walking out in tears, including people who I named, including people who came to see the show without Lynn because they had bought their ticket too. And so they were coming with him and they came anyway. You know what I mean? And it was like this moment where people were like, girl, you 
little girl from the Bronx, you see who you pulling in? And I'm like, oh, I'm not pulling it in. I am a vehicle because right. I chose right. to show up in the authenticity. And I chose to look at my sisters as sisters and not as my competition because I wanted to make more money and I wanted a show to be bigger. It's not about my show. It's about my people. And that served me so well. And the last thing I, I'll say is my cast was fully black. We had all black actors. And when we put out the casting call and we said black actors who speak Spanish, people were like, why don't you just say Afro Latina? And I'm like, because this is a story about black people in New York City. So I don't need to say the Latina part because if somebody from Nigeria comes and speaks that Dominican Spanish down, baby, I'm a cast them. <laughs> right. Right. So, right. Yeah. We always right. have areas of opportunity for impact. We just have to allow ourselves the confidence to say, yeah, I'm going to tackle that. Right. Yeah. Right. And also I want to say, first of all, like, come on. With all of what you just said, that's just like that having moments. Whole, that was but a whole before, word. I know, like before, like I jump in, right? And and I wanna, <laughs> I I wanna echo something I had said. Zuli had has heard me say this before, right? Every one of us has our lane, right? Meaning, I can't do what Zuli's doing at Pittsburgh, right? I can do what I do. I can't do what you do, Julissa. And you know what? Check this out. It's okay because I don't need to, right? But. For me, I absolutely relate to that moment of like that little bit of rage, right? Because, you know, when I, you know, when you're writing something, you do some amount of research and you're looking at how people have written about someone else and you're like, well, damn, they're missing it. I know they're missing it, right? And that's where like the confidence to insert your perspective and to go, no, 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 wait a minute. I, this is what I know to be true, right? Is it, That's just the act of creation. It's the reason why, you know, when academics want to academic, like, I'm like, check this out. This is a creative process. Like, we're putting things into the world. And if you want to talk about your scholarly voice and all this stuff, knock yourself out. I know that for me, I am much more in touch with, I know that my the books that I write, the exhibition, I mean, an exhibition is the most ephemeral thing that I've done, right? And I had to, like, breathe through that and go, okay, but there's going to be a catalog and it's going to be fine. But still, like... Mm -hmm. I was still intentional about like the experience that I wanted people to have when they walked into the space um, down to like the font on the wall text, the colors that we chose, the, the banner image, all of that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I also am a, a series editor for two book series, right? One at SUNY Press, which is Afro Latinx Futures, which is within the academic space. It opens up to all humanities and all social sciences, edited volumes, translations, everything. That's on SUNY, SUNY Press. And then with Vanderbilt University Press, I'm a co-series editor. We just launched this a few months ago called uh, a series called Global Black Writers in Translation. Because what we know to be true is that Black writers of any language group are the least that are translated. And so making space, like for me, it's about getting in position and making space and opening doors because what the hell am I doing, right? If it's just about me, like it doesn't need to be all about, like, and there comes a point where it's like, you know, I've gotten to the point in my career, I'm almost always like the youngest in academic spaces. I was the youngest when I was in PhD and that's cool and that's fine, right? But I'm bored with myself. I know the work that I'm doing and I will continue to create. But if other people aren't being put on, what am I doing? It can't be all about me. And so that's where like that shift of like community, like, yeah, there was a time in my life I was like, right, yeah, I got a double PhD. Uh, 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 like what we, you know, and I'm from the Bronx, Tracy Towers, Mashula Parkway, like Fortrain, you know, and when I'm talking to, to students in New York City, they know what that is. Right. But, you know, for this recording, that's going to outlast this moment, right? You know, yeah, this is how Black creativity looks. Yeah. In Espanol, in Portuguese, in Creole, and, you know, like, this is how we do, you know? And so I, again, I thank you for the platform and for the opportunity to even share um, with both of you. Of course, yeah. I, mean, I just wanted to be in community with people that I really admire and that like, I hope, you know, we'll of course continue to have connections after this, but um, uh, so um, we have a Kaisha on the chat that said, no questions, just gratitude to all of you for this dialogue. And I'll share this offering from Black feminist Audre Lord. As Black women, we have the right and responsibility to define ourselves and to seek our allies in common cause. But most of all, as Black women, we have the right and responsibility to recognize each other without fear. Period. And that's Period. what we're doing here. 
right? And that's what we continue to do. And if any, if for folks in the call, biggest takeaway, I think from this, the, the end of this conversation is you're not in competition with your people. Interdependence and that community care is the future. Mm -hmm. Our surviving, beyond surviving, our thriving and reaching our fullest potentials as individuals. Mm -hmm. The collective is what nurtures our individuality, our nuanced, hyper-focused um, narratives. Mm -hmm. So the, it's so easy, especially in academia, to focus on yourself and be so focused on yourself and then, you know, cut throat, throwing people under the bus paquet. For right. what? Yeah. For the ivory tower, for what? Right, because it damn sure wasn't built for us. It was not built by us. This ain't that for part. us. That part, <laughs> I think that's so important. And like, I just, and not to cut you off, but like that to me, if there's a parting word I can leave you with is like, please know yourself and what you come from enough to know when the things that they're putting you in competition towards are actually yours at all, whether you play by their rules or not. Because we have now. a lot of people I'm who are now. in our community who make it very high and we love them and we honor them, but they're not doing crap for us. Why? Because their intention is keeping up a system of colonialism or white supremacy that it doesn't matter what you look like. You could be Prieto, like they say. And if that's yeah. the vehicle you're pushing, and we've seen it because we've seen countries, Black countries and places where these issues and what is it that they're following? They're following the same threads that are coming from the same evils that harmed us. And so it's proof that it doesn't matter if it's just you happening with you and your people. These systems are going to screw us over and the systems that we have been have been lost, especially through the African diaspora, are a lot that foundationally put up a society that yeah. is one feet in a lot of cases led maternally, not paternally. So a lot of this machismo is not really mm -hmm. centered, but that that I guess femininity, that touch, that love, that connection is so much more deeper than whatever anybody can get in a competition. And they took that from us. And so now we're out here fighting each other. And as audiences and consumers, it doesn't matter if you're not the artist, if you are a consumer, what you choose to digest is what people put their attention to as well. If they're chasing you for your dollar. So where are they, where are you leading them? to spend their dollars. So it's important that you also support these artists, even if they're not Beyonce, right? Like support each other, show up for each other, not just the ones who made it because the ones who haven't quote unquote made it yet are the ones that are building what more people need to make it. So help us build it. Even if in our lifetime, we may never be the Beyonce. Right, right. And, right. or you may, but that's the thing. You, like, or you, or you may be, or Beyonce's you know, got hers and you're well, like, and you're Julissa, like, yeah, and I celebrate. And where are we and at without, oh, this Oscar, all oh, this chart topping, do the dig. I know it feels like we have to fight. And that's the other issue is we need more platforms that make it easier for people to access these types of works because what they put on the algorithm is what people are going to lean into because as consumers, we're lazy and that is okay. But this intention is important. So if there's nothing else you walk away with, if you're not an artist and you're like, well, I'm never going to do what they're doing, do for us then help us in that way by supporting and elevating our works for others who need it support our work sign up for our newsletters right share all right. things in your city right, right. I, i'm fine i mean follow us on social media and also understand i mean for me the a parting word is understanding how deep scarcity mindset goes and understanding that when people claim a, a first mentality or an only mentality they have a scarcity mindset there is more than enough for all of us i promise you Right. And so that switch, I remember being in a presentation where someone was like, oh, but why do you have that series when there's this series? And I was like, are we really talking about the fact that there are four series dedicated to Afro Latinidad when like every year there's 100 books on Emily Dickinson or on George Washington or on Abraham Lincoln? Like, what are we what are we yeah, so like, used to, are we so used to scraps that we yeah. cannot demand for ourselves more? And so, so if we can lean into that. the if we can always lean into the more, there's mm -hmm. not enough. I promise you, the only space that we are overrepresented in is in incarcerated spaces. Every single else, we are needed. Every single space on this earth, we are needed. And mm -hmm. so please just like shift if you think like, oh no, but I'm not good enough. Oh, but I don't have it. Oh, you are telling yourself no before they tell you no. Stop it. 
You are born with God-given rights. If you believe in God, or you believe in the universe, or you believe in spirit, or you believe whatever you believe in, you were created, you are built to do something, and we need you. Shift into abundance mindset, please. Yes. And on that note, if you need somebody to gas you up, go back <laughs> to the top and listen to that word again and again so that you do the work that you need to do to make all of us uplifted and supported in our in our blackness and our diasporic beautiful blackness i want to say thank you so so much to julissa and vanessa for this beautiful conversation and this beautiful time thank you all so much thank i am you. so happy that you guys uh, decided to do this my heart thank is so full and I think this is the last virtual space that we have for the conference. Our next um, event is in person tomorrow, our closing ceremony. So we have completely capped off our uh, virtual space. I wanna just thank you both so much. I'll be in touch with both of you um, personally because um, we've got things to talk about. <laughs> yeah. And so um, if uh, with that, I wanna say, but goodbye to everybody. Thank you so much. We're going to end this session now. And uh, thank you for those beautiful words. We really, we we gave a word today at the end there. <laughs> oh, yes. And there okay. will, these are really going to be recorded um, and they'll be on demand after the conference. So um, I will share, we'll share those with both of you as well. So, and with everybody that was registered for the conference. Thank you all so much.